Let me put the framework together to figure out how regular everyday people could get involved in this industry. And once I do that, I'm just going to pass it on, pass it out, give it out. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to an episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Mata Figaro, co-founder and CEO of Can Powerment. Mata, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? So well, so well. Really excited to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Stoked to dive in. Kellen, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm excited to talk to Mata and uh, another East Coaster, I guess, right? Yes, she is. What's for the record, your location? I'm in Jersey City, New Jersey, born and raised in Jersey. First generation American. Let's go. Let's go. Let's another, go. another East Coaster <laughs> for the map. So, so Mata, for our listeners that aren't familiar about you, can you give it a little background about yourself? Yeah. So uh, my name's Mata Figaro, like I said before. First generation. My family came here from Haiti. Uh, just so really lucky, honestly, to be here. I started a brand called Butter Cake back in 2015, and I was just slinging really good butter cakes. I'm a pastry chef by trade. Got to enjoy working for Whole Foods for a few years in management. So that was really fun. But then I just got tired of it. So I tried my own business making butter cakes. Uh, about a few months into doing that, a woman came up to me and she was like, hey, I got to go through chemo. Can you turn your cake into an edible for me? And I was like, hell no, because it's 2015. I'm not going to jail for your ass. Uh-uh. There's just no way. She comes back a few months later and she's like, come on, butter cake. I really like I think you should do this. You should do this. And she just really encouraged me. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll practice on you, but we got to keep this a secret. And then she didn't keep it a secret. She shared with all her friends. She shared with her family. And like, it kind of just took up and, and blew up from there. And now here I am eight years later, uh, I applied for a license in the state of New Jersey under my business called Can Powerment, in which we are really excited to be conditionally licensed. We're going to be producing Butter Cake and we'll be producing for other people with awesome brands that want to get into the market out here. Many congratulations. So I guess my, my first question was, was that your first experience dabbling between the intersection of cannabis-infused cooking? For the public? Yeah. <laughs> and what about for yourself? No, I've been a little stoner probably since I was born. <laughs> and, it, and it was through cooking was how you consumed or was it through variety? Oh, no, I, so I was actually a smoker when I first started. I had herniated three discs in my lower back in my chef life. Yeah, and it sucked and it turned me into a vegetable for a few months. And I was just on the couch doing all kinds of opioids that doctors prescribed. And finally, my mom and, and a friend of mine were like, yo, we don't even recognize you. Your personality's gone. And when my mom disappeared, my friend was like, yo, try some, try some of these edibles, try some weed. And then I kind of just was like, all right. But I never thought it was going to be a business. I never thought it was going to lead me here. Like me and my personal consumption, is, it was just like, smoke some weed. My back hurts. Smoke some weed. Doing yoga. And then I started doing the edibles and now I'm just, I love it for all the health reasons. I'm able to do sugar-free, gluten-free, vegan, all kinds of cool stuff. So eating weed is my preferred way now. What's your favorite uh, form factor to make with? Is it butter or is it a tincture? What is it? Ooh, honestly, the more that science continues to develop really awesome ways for me to infuse, the more excited I get. Um, I, I recently came across a company called Azuka. And they do like sugars and, and all kinds of cool things like that. So I feel like lately these days, that's been my favorite thing. And how, how, so how, like for, for new consumers that are trying to get interested, but are petrified of, let's say, the infused coursing, how, how do new consumers can feel comfortable kind of adapting the new space? I would say do your research. Make sure you like talk to your chef beforehand if you have access to that person. Always start low and slow. I don't care how good it tastes. Have some self-control. <laughs> take a little bite. Wait 20 minutes. See how you feel and take it from there. So what other products are uh, uh, involved with Butter Cake? Obviously, we, we, we got the grand reveal on the naming behind that, which was definitely one of my questions. But what other products are, are, are in the arsenal? Um, so Butter Cake, shockingly enough, our number one seller are our gummies. Um, we have a new form factor out into the market right now. It's just like the uh, Listerine strips. You put it on your tongue and it starts to dissolve and you get an effect. So that's just really, really fun. We're doing it with hemp derived Delta 8 right now uh, while we wait for the license to come through so that we could push it into the market with straight up THC the way everybody wants it. How did that idea come to be? Uh, so in New Jersey, they decided to make their regu regulations for the adult use market so that we can't have baked goods. Um, I'm on a special task force to change that, by the way. So new rules are on the Thankfully. way. <laughs> Thankfully. But when they said no baked goods, and I was like, well, damn, 
I guess there's no butter cakes for New Jersey. What else am I going to do? And I just wrecked my brain back and forth. My childhood friend since third grade, Jimmy, he's also my business partner. And he's had incredible experience um, in consumer packaged goods with a company out in Germany. Um, And then when I told him like, yo, we got no baked goods, but I really love doing my tincture. I really love doing my oil spray. Let's find something cool that people could do use through the mouth. And that's how we landed on the strips. So why, why no big goods? Because then you got to get the health department involved. In New Jersey, every municipality works as its own state. So now we're talking about the CRC dealing with 500 and something different health departments on top of the health department for the entire state. So it's just a lot um, for them to try to handle when they're just trying to open up the market to begin with. So that's why. I like how understanding you are about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm That's going a very to cordial it. answer. <laughs> I'm about to throw a fit in the corner over here. I'm upset that I can't be getting those products. So uh, I, I feel like I'm so understanding about it because I'm a legacy operator. Just because they don't get it doesn't mean I don't get it yet. Yeah. So I'm just going to help them get it so that we can all legally <laughs> do it. Get it. <laughs> so I know Butter Cake's one of the brands underneath the umbrella. What else is the primary goal of Camp Powerment? Honestly, we are looking for underrepresented individuals. We're looking for the little guys, you know, the MSOs, they could do the cookies and all that good stuff. But we are really just looking to empower people that thought that they couldn't do what I'm doing right now and people that don't have two and a half million dollars to get a license. You know, we really want to just lower the barriers of entry so we can make some field gummies or some Kellen cakes, whatever. I like it. I like it. I know one of your missions is diversify the products on a retail shelf. Can you kind of expand on that? Yeah, I pulled up to California, Palm Springs, which I should have assumed wasn't going to be the most, <laughs> most diverse place. But I shot my shot, you know, and I asked, I said, hey, which one of these brands is women made? No answer. OK, fine. Which one of these is black owned? No answer. And I was like, damn, if I'm going to be a manufacturer, I need to make sure that every single dispensary can at least answer that question for somebody that walks into the store. I think that's so important. But I guess my question to you is for a consumer who wants to support a brand like that, but isn't sure which one is owned by those individuals, how how do they figure that out? Because if a bud tender doesn't know, there could be a brand on the shelf. But how how do we kind of align the information with the individual? Oh, wow. I don't know. Maybe we should do something together, Brian, where we just put all the information up where all the Black-owned businesses are. Ooh, like a directory. Yeah, let's get it. Drop it on the dime. Every week, we'll just do a quick list. Here's five Black-owned businesses you can support. Five minority-owned, women-owned, LGBTQ-owned, all of it. Yeah, because I think that's such an important thing, right? Because people do want to support certain types of businesses when they go in. And sometimes there's an information disconnect, especially maybe it could be that one bud tender that doesn't know, but four others do. And that's mm-hmm. one of the biggest challenges that that I've seen is that there's like the, the missing gap of information transfer between the individuals in, inside. Agreed. I'm I'm going to attempt to solve that. A sticker, maybe I'm just kind of brainstorming out loud. Hey, like uh, a certification, it's got to be different in every state, though. You know, it's gonna be someone's top one, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. So, a question for you is I've heard you say, I'm gonna put my mask on first and then help the others around me. Why? So, when I say my mask on first, I'm talking about butter cake. You know, I started that it's a completely legacy operation, and not for nothing, being a legacy operator is hard as fuck. You cannot walk into a bank right now with a duffel bag of $200,000 of cash saying, okay, I want to buy a house now. I want to buy a car now. Like Life right now, the way it is, is not what it used to be for for legacy operators back in the day. And so for me, it really just means like, let me put the framework together to figure out how regular everyday people could get involved in this industry. And once I do that, I'm just going to pass it on, pass it out, give it out. I'm I'm not interested in gatekeeping. I'm not interested in making people pay uh, me for, for you know, templates and guidelines and stuff like that. I really just want to make it as easy and equitable as possible for whoever wants to be involved to get involved. Yeah, it's, it's so important to have someone like yourself trailblazing from the front because some people are just a little more hesitant until they see someone else kind of pushing forward. Not everyone's meant to be the alpha to top down the trees and say, hey, like I'm going to handle it first. You guys can follow me. I'm going to help everyone through. That's right. It also is it's also more genuine that you're doing it yourself and not charging other people to, to help. You know what I mean? Yeah. The first time a consultant hit me up when I decided I was going to go on this journey, he was like, oh, $50,000 up front. And I was like, what? 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 To consult me, to tell me that I need to get a lawyer that's going to charge me another 30, 40, 50,000 on top of that? That's crazy. Those are billable hours too. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So social equity needs to be reflected on deals on paper, not just verbally. 
Uh, obviously, that's a the massive sticking point for so many to stop saying the words and start doing the actions. Yeah. You know, what can what can companies do to do that? Shit, when it comes down to revenue splits, it's not 50-50. If you are a business, a manufacturer, an MSO, whatever, and you're in a position where you can help somebody else get in, why are we not doing 5149 in favor of the social equity applicant? We're not 50-50s, no more predatory practices. You know, we just need more um legal people as well to really help guide us to make sure that we're not falling into these practices and business owners time to speak up. Don't just sign the deal for the sake of doing a deal because then we make no difference as a collective. Stoners make great blood donors, true or false? Hell yeah, that's true. Very true. Why? So there, for some reason, there's like this stigma out there that if you are a cannabis consumer, stoner, weed-friendly person, that you cannot donate blood. And that's actually not true at all. With COVID being here, we're actually finding ourselves um, in the United States in the first blood crisis ever. We lost a lot of people um, clearly to COVID. And then with putting all of us inside and having a shutdown and being so virtual, it's hard for blood banks and for hospitals, the American Red Cross, places like that to really tap into people and start getting more blood. So now more people are sick, less people are donating. We have a massive shortage. And this is a huge opportunity for the cannabis industry to get in and get into donating because, you know, we're, we're fucking great people as stoners. Why not? And you think it uh, helps with the actual blood donation part that like, you know, like you smoke weed, your eyes get red, it's a vasodilator. So maybe it opens your blood vessels up, makes it easier to, to poke from a... Possibly. Uh, I'm not a doctor by any means. Me meaning. neither. Me None neither. <laughs> ever, is ever associated with the FBA. But I'm pretty sure with more research, being a cannabis consumer and a d- blood donor has to be a positive thing. I agree. Mate, if you were to start over or start a competitor, which part of your business would be most difficult for you to replicate? To be honest, I recently thought about creating another brand and I haven't actually pulled the trigger on that because I'm realizing how hard it is to actually start a brand. Butter cake was something I think I got lucky with. I was already making butter cakes, butter cake. The name just fell into my lap. It all worked. Um, I don't know if I could recreate that magic twice. I think you could. And I think that there's behind every piece of luck, there's putting yourself in the right positions to be successful. And I think if you continue to place yourself in positions to be successful, luck seems to find you, right? I think that's kind of one of the things is people kind of attract good luck. And that involves putting in the work and hustling and making sure you're getting things done. Because if you weren't producing the products, probably be really hard to start a brand behind Buy the Cake. That's very true. It is very true. What is one product request that you get a lot, but you'll never build? Oh my God, like these designer bong cakes or something. I'm not a cake decorator by any means. There's like this trend going on where people are decorating cakes and physically turning them into bongs so you could smoke your birthday cake. Please don't hit me up for that because I'm never doing it. What about a wedding cake? (laughs) No. I I did see the the bong cake. That looked just outrageous. (laughs) Do you share that too? Or is it like a one hitter for like one person just like, it's this. Yeah, I would imagine if it's my birthday and my cake, it's a one hitter. But yeah, cake decorating is it, that's the no for me. I don't like decorating. What is one factor statistic operating in the cannabis industry that would shock other individuals? I don't think I know. I don't think I know a stat that would be shocking to the industry because I feel like this industry is so new. Everything that we're doing is either so shockingly good or so shockingly bad. <laughs> <laughs> What's the future roadmap? The future roadmap. Ah, man, I'm hoping for interstate commerce. Near term, interstate commerce would be awesome, especially on the East Coast. We see California and Washington figured it out. So it would be awesome to see, you know, tri-state, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Let's throw Connecticut in there as well. They're coming online. If we could get some interstate commerce, that would be sick. And that would set us up for an even better future when federal comes. Agreed. 20 years from now, we will look back and say, that was barbaric. I can't believe we did that in the cannabis industry. What is that? 20 years from now, I'm going to be like, I can't believe I paid a municipality $20,000 for a non-refundable application fee for me to even operate there. That's crazy. That is crazy. And 20 years from now, I'm probably going to ask for my money back. (laughs) (laughs) The government always gets theirs first. Yeah, that's right. Before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests, if you could sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on to the next generation, what would it be? Listen to yourself first. Listen to yourself first. I feel like if I had listened to 
to the people that are the most important in my life, my mom, my dad, my siblings, if I really had listened to them, I would have went to college. I would have got a four-year degree. I'd be sitting behind a desk working some nine to five corporate job that I freaking hate. But I never listened to them. I didn't listen to them when they told me weed wasn't an option. I didn't listen to them when they told me culinary wasn't a career. And I damn sure didn't listen to them when they told me butter cake was the stupidest name they ever heard. So <laughs> <laughs> if I could tell anybody any kind of advice, listen to yourself. Follow whatever it is that you want to do. Everybody else that doesn't agree, they'll either, they'll either find out later down the line that they should have given you better advice or they just won't be involved and you'll be happy anyway. Love it. Prediction time. Mada, what else can be done to help legacy operators feel comfortable converting to the legal market? The thing that can be done is that we need our law enforcement to stop threatening us. That's really what it is. Like the only reason why I felt comfortable putting my face and my name and my, you know, identity out there was because my law team and advisors, they promised me that they had my back. But outside of me trusting them, I would have never done it. So if our, you know, people that make the laws, the rules and regulations could say, hey, legacy operator, we get it. Please, you want to you want to switch over to the legal side? We won't punish you for that. Kellen. I agree. I also think maybe lowering that the barrier to make that transition, right? Uh, Mata was talking $2.5 million. Even if you were a legacy operator, like, I doubt you show up to the Capitol building with $2.5 million in cash and you're like, hey, can I fill out my application now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's just not how it's going to work. So I think oh. lowering the barrier to entry is probably the most important aspect associated with that. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I think that there's so many different things that maybe could be helpful, but it, it's so hard to tell because each person feels differently and each government operates so differently. So I think kind of making it easier for people to understand how the situation operates, right? Instead of having to pay these massive fines or licensing opportunities to the government in order to submit your application, if we can lower the barriers of entry to make things easier and cleaner for people to understand how to operate... I think it'll help people feel more comfortable. I think one of the reasons a lot of people feel distrust with governments is because they don't trust them because they they don't really operate the way we think that they should. And maybe that's a personal approach. But at the end of the day, I think that's going to be a big challenge. And hopefully we can find ways to overcome that to allow people to continue to move in the right direction. That's right. That is absolutely right. Also, I'd like to say that there's no correlation between legacy operating and being wealthy. <laughs> So people think that for some reason that like if you're a legacy operator, you've been selling drugs illegally for so long, weed specifically, that you're like super freaking rich. It's not really the case. Only like 2% of us are probably that rich. So Martha, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to learn more and they want to buy butter cake products. Where can they find you? Oh man, I'm all over the internet. Instagram, Twitter, butter cake. It's B-U-T-A cake. We're on buttercake.shop for the legacy stuff, buttercakewellness.com for the legal stuff. You can always Google me, Mata Figaro. I'm everywhere. We'll link it up in the show notes. Thanks for taking the time. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys.